Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming out. If you were with us last week, thanks for coming back. I hope you had time to go home and sort of digest all the stuff we talked about. And now it's great to have you back for more. Um, last week I didn't get much of an intro to our discussion because I think the purpose of the discussion was rather self-apparent. We're a Christian university and we were looking to discuss the future of religion within that context. This week, however, we're going to be analyzing that through a Jewish perspective. For many of you, this may be something new. You may have no, no prior knowledge of Judaism outside of our Religion 101 or 102 classes, which looks at ancient Judaism. So for you, I hope that you, you can learn something about this prominent world religion in its modern context. Um, however, as we go into tonight, I hope that you learn something more than that. I hope that you can see through discussing with these rabbis sort of the universality of our search for God in these modern times. And I know through this discussion we will all learn so much, not only through our differences, but also through our similarities. Um, we have a great panel tonight. We have um, two of our three rabbis here already, and we'll let uh, Dr. Darty introduce them, and hopefully we'll have our last one joining us shortly. But we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Darty to introduce them. Great, thank you, David. All right, tonight we have, first of all, well, Rabbi, Adlerstein will be coming in late, so when you see a rabbi come walking in through the back, you'll know what that's all about, I think. Nope. No. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> first of all, we have Rabbi Judith Halevi, and she is at the Malibu Jewish Community Center and Synagogue. She served as the rabbi of the Malibu Jewish Center since 1996. She holds advanced degrees in international relations from both Rutgers and Columbia. She was ordained in 1992 in New Mexico, my home state, and later came to Los Angeles to co-found Metiva, a center for Jewish spirituality and Sarah's Tent, a community based on Judaism and creativity. Rabbi Halevi has been a member of the executive committee of the Board of Rabbis of Southern California since 2002 and currently serves as its president. She is a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, having completed three years of intensive study in the rabbinic leadership program in 2010. And secondly, we have Rabbi Chaim Seidlerfeller. Rabbi Seidlerfeller currently serves as the director of Hillel at UCLA, a position he has held for over 38 years. He was ordained in 1971 at Yeshiva University, from which he also received a master's in rabbinic literature. He has taught Kabbalah and Talmud at the University of Judaism, is a fellow of the Shalom Harman Institute for Advanced Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, and is a member of the Academy Academic Advisory Board of the Wilstein Institute for Social Policy. He's also a member of the faculty of the Vexner Heritage Foundation, and is a Lehman faculty fellow at the Brandeis Barden Institute. Before coming to UCLA, he served as director of Hillel at Ohio State, and as a rabbi in a congregation in New Bedford, Massachusetts. <clears throat> so, uh, thank you to the two rabbis. Let us uh, warmly welcome them with a round of applause. <laughs> so, welcome to our campus. Uh, we're in the midst of a three-part series. Last Tuesday we talked about Christianity. We had some local pastors. Uh, and then next week, a week from tonight, we'll be looking at Islam. So it's an Abrahamic uh, three-part series. So thank you for joining us tonight. It's a privilege for us to, to host you here. And Rabbi uh, Halevi, it's nice to have a neighbor here at Pepperdine, although I'm sure you've been here many, many times before. But I love it. <laughs> I love being here. Great. Well, tonight we have questions uh, that have been prepared by... Uh, students in the Glazer Institute, uh, just a whole array of topics. And what I've done is gone through the, the topics and the questions and tried to select some that I think are timely and relevant. We have about an hour, maybe a little more than an hour, something like that. But we'll be, we'll be winding it down in about an hour from now. And uh, one of our uh, new hires, a professor in the Glazer Institute, will close us out, Monica Osborne. She's sitting here in the front row. Thank you for being here, Monica. And thank you to the Glazer Institute for, for hosting this. Judaism. Where do we begin in talking about the future of Judaism in a one-hour period? 
Today there are maybe 13, maybe 14 uh, million Jews in the world. So uh, it's a comparatively small religion. Um, is it shrinking? Is it expanding? Um, yes, no, why? Just to lay out some basics for the student body that may not know much about Judaism. It, is it an expanding religion? Is it shrinking? Some initial thoughts. By the way, we'll just uh, pass two microphones or just one? The last one, just pass it back and forth. It's pretty much stable, believe it or not. Okay. Um, just on a simple demographic level, we know that there are about 13 and a half million Jews in the world. And I, I actually looked up the statistics to be able to answer this for you, but, but it's something that we know. The Jewish population growth worldwide is close to 0%. And it has risen 0.03. We are not disappearing. Our demographics have shifted. Clearly, the European Jewish community is reconstituting itself slowly. But just about half of the world's Jews live in North America and Canada. And interestingly enough for all of you, the second largest Jewish population center in the United States is here in Los Angeles, where we have about 650,000 Jews. So we're a big, active community here, and it's very exciting to be a rabbi in this community. At the same time, the rest, about 37, it says here, percent, but I think the percentage ever since this was taken has risen slightly. I'd say about 40% of world Jewry now lives in Israel, which is an amazing statement when I say this to you because Israel was born in 1948. There was no Israel. So we have reconstituted a nation that is a Jewish state and a very significant percentage of world Jewry actually, about 40%, actually lives in Tel Aviv is the, I think just barely the second largest Jewish city, New York being the first, but that may be an out of date statement. There are something like two and a half million people in Tel Aviv. So that's the demographic answer. Jews have never been a huge mass as a body of uh, people. We suffered an enormous loss with the death of six million Jews. And my lifetime, which pretty much parallels the end of the war, has been the story of the reforming of the Jewish people. So that's just on numbers mm -hmm. question. That's how Where we're... Judaism is going and what we are doing with this rebirth and the vitality that it was in is within Judaism is a much larger question and I will you know, open that question up. I'm not gonna take the mic for all of it. Okay, Rabbi Seidlerfeller, would you like to come in? Yeah. Um, I actually I must tell you that, that I'm not that interested in numbers. Uh, I, I find it, uh, I, I'm glad that you have the numbers, uh, but, I, but I want you to think of them as being unimportant, although to know that there are, you know, that there's a critical mass of Jews, there, are, there is a critical mass of Jews. The real issue is, what are the Jews doing? And, um, and also, uh, what was just opened up by Rabbi Halevi, the question is, um, how Jewish are Jews? today. Uh, and when I saw the question about is Judaism a shrinking religion, uh, I saw the question in terms of is religion shrinking among Jews? Uh, I think that's the real issue, not whether the numbers of Jews are shrinking. Um, although that will, that will also happen. Um, that is, the numbers of Jews will shrink as Judaism shrinks among Jews. Although it will take a lot longer because America is a very tolerant place, and I think uh, Jewish community will stay on for a long time. And, and there is a type of culture that sustains Jewish life without religion, or without what we would call religion. Um, that's also a very interesting question. Uh, what do you say to a Jew who has a Passover Seder, who says, I'm a secular Jew? 
What do you say to a Jew who goes to synagogue on the high holidays and says, I'm a secular Jew? How do you understand that? I would, want, I would wonder whether you have a framework for understanding that. That most probably describes a majority of Jews in America today. Uh, so that we're dealing with something that's, a, I think, a distinctive phenomenon, uh, a community, a religious community, that doesn't necessarily define itself in, in religious terms. Um, and as a, as a rabbi, someone who's very critical and skeptical about the staying power of Jews if they don't hold on to religion. That's a problem. I think it's a problem in general for uh, communities and for America, but in particular for Jews. Uh, maybe we'll, I don't know if you want me to move in, in, into that discussion now. Not, not yet. Uh, we'll uh, maybe come around to it. Uh, I, let, let me just say one other thing that about, about the dynamics of, of Jewish life. There is, there is a dimension uh, of Judaism that's really uh, growing and, and vital, uh, or an aspect, or a, or a denomination, or, a, or a, 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 a branch of Judaism. And that happens to be Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews are very, that's the strongest Jewish community today. I don't know if everybody's going to agree with me, uh, Rabbi Halevi. Uh, my, uh, but um, uh, I'm sure Rabbi Adelstein would agree with me. Uh, but, I, but I think that, that it, those of you may, if you want to take a look at a statistical study, take a look at a recent study by the Federation in New York City, um, which determined um, that 74% of all child, Jewish children in New York City are ra being raised or are identified as Orthodox. That's unbelievable, because nationally, uh, Orthodox Jews constitute only 13% of American Jews. In New York City, it's a larger percentage. It's an inner city, a traditional city, first place of, of settlement. So you're going to get uh, a much more traditional and conservative population. However, you, uh, you're dealing also with an ultra-Orthodox population in New, York, in New York City, which with large numbers of children. So there's one side of Judaism that's galloping ahead and actually maybe <coughs> gaining, gaining adherence and certainly in percentage of Jewish life. Um, there is, on the other hand, I would say liberal what, what I would call largely, and it's a broad swath, what I call liberal Judaism and liberal Jews is in decline, numerically and also substantively. Uh, and I see that process of the increase and the intensi in intensification of Orthodox life and the decline of liberal Jewish life on campus. I see it in the next generation. So even if people can report to me that they have other experiences, I'm watching it unfold in front of my eyes. I've seen the generations change in the last 40 years that I've been working on campus. Uh, and I've seen a, 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 very, a, a very, I would say, palpable, uh, remarkable decline among, within the liberal Jewish community uh, and in terms of its knowledge, in terms of its literacy, in terms of its familiarity with the basics of Judaism, and on the other hand, an increase uh, of uh, knowledge of, of commitment among Orthodox Jews, although they are, on campus, a smaller community. Mm, good, yeah, helpful. Very helpful. You want to follow up on something on that? Um, of course, I agree, and, because Jews always have to look at the other side of the planet, and so from the head... We, we, we often talk about the House of Hillel and the House of Shammai, right? That these were great scholars who argued all the time, and it's part of our tradition. I uh, work with the other segment of the community. I work with the liberal edge of the community. Mine is a Reconstructionist synagogue, which places it somewhere between conservative and reform. Don't even go there. What it really means is that um, it's very liberal in its attitudes towards who's a clergy person and intermarriage, but um, its liturgy is quite conservative. What does all that mean? It means that as a rabbi here in Malibu, people come in from a broad spectrum. People whose parents were super orthodox and people who kind of knew they were Jewish, but their parents ran away from being Jewish because it wasn't a very cool thing to be Jewish, and especially after World War II when, you know, being Jewish could get you killed, especially in Europe. So best to keep your head down and not give your kids anything. 
And those people then have children. And so what the rabbi is saying is very true. It got like Xerox copies that get thinner, right? <laughs> At the same time, this didn't kill the desire to be Jewish. So it's like we had a teacher, I had a teacher named Zalman Schachter, Rabbi Zalman, who used to say it's freeze dry. That once you added the water and the moisture and the nourishment back to a vibrant Jewish community, you can reconstitute to a certain extent what has always been there. So I have a very vibrant study scene. I have a fairly vibrant prayer scene on Saturday mornings, but I can't get an everyday minion, an everyday prayer group. There's no way I could get that in now. And yet, I have seen the change in the 15 years that I've been here that has gone to the other side of a lot of celebration, a lot of understanding, and a lot of study. But it's in little pieces, right? It's a synagogue here, a synagogue there. Um, I feel like there is a resurgence within the liberal Jewish world, but it may not look like what it looked like in 1938. And this is the 21st century, and where Judaism will go in the 21st century will depend a great deal on both the Orthodox and their growing ranks, but also on a place like Malibu, where someone described us this week as a hyperactive synagogue. Yeah, it's like children. Yeah. It, there's, there, there are doors back in to a very rich tradition. All right, great. Yeah, just uh, some Judaism 101. If you haven't had world religions, there are three in the textbooks, basically three major forms of Judaism. There's Orthodox, which is considered the, the most conservative. Then there's Conservative, which is middle of the road. And then there's Reformed, which is the most liberal of the three. However, in between all those are numerous other styles and forms, some that defy categorization. So, but that's just the basic model, the basic typology of Judaism. I, I recommend um, a film that I just saw this week, uh, The Chosen, Chaim Potok's film. Uh, you should read the book or watch the film or both. But it gives you an insight into the tensions, the different ways of understanding uh, Judaism and living the Jewish life in a fairly modern context, so in a, in a recent context in, in America. It's actually set in the United States. In New York, isn't it? Yeah. Set in New York. In Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Uh, excellent film. Great city of Brooklyn. Excellent film. Uh, I have a question. for You're both rabbis. Um, what do you do when a non-Jewish student comes to your synagogue, starts falling in love with Judaism, and says, I think I want to connect with Judaism. I mean, this is a question I think college students would be interested in. How do I, can I become a Jew? Um, how do I do it? Would, it? would I be accepted? I mean, it's typically understood as an ethnic faith. But can, can I become Jewish? I'd, I'd like to hear uh, responses to, to that question. Well, first, we'll take the campus. So you All right, yeah. Um. Um, one, I, I, I always would ask, um, I, I have to tell you the truth, uh, that I, I haven't worked with uh, conversion uh, in a long time, um, only because it, I, 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 I devote a lot of time to it. I consider it very serious. Um, and it's a question of um, helping a person uh, transform their identity, and, um, and it's about religious training, and it's one of the most perhaps one of the most serious things that I've ever done in my life. Uh, I can tell you that among my students who studied for conversion, uh, there are three rabbis, one Orthodox, one Conservative, wow. and one Reform. So, <laughs> among them. So, it, um, so um, it's certainly possible, obviously possible. And it doesn't take 10 years, uh, only five. Uh, and, and, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to take that long. Uh, um, but the first thing I would do in, in, with, a, with a student who came to me who was interested, uh, I would ask them why. I'm interested in knowing why. 
I want to know what compels them. Um, um, what, what they're either running away from or what they're running to. I, I, I don't think that anybody engages in a major change in their life without some psychological dimension. Uh, good or bad, I mean, I'm not judging the person when I say psychological. I mean, there, there, there have to be some factors that would drive someone away from a, from a religion of birth. Uh, it's too important. It's about relationship to parents. It's about relationship to community. And why would you want to leave the community of your birth? In fact, I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in encouraging people to do that. I think it's too difficult a thing to do. Uh, I don't want to, you know, mess with your head. Why should I do that? I think people, I must tell you something, and maybe I'm, I don't know the, the doctrines of the university or, or, or whatever. I think people who see converts are doing something that's questionably, questionable ethically. Uh, I, I really mean that in a modern world where we understand freedom, we understand uh, the need for people to be able to express themselves, and where we also understand that, that each religious tradition represents something distinctive and legitimate. What right do I have to raid someone else's religious tradition and say, you belong to me? You don't belong to me at all. I, and, and, and you should find your road to fulfillment hopefully in your religious tradition, unless you're dissatisfied, unless you really seek something else because you're looking for a different road. And there are differences, and I would understand that. Um, and then we would uh, begin uh, an exploration. Um, now, I, 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 I know we don't, we don't have enough time to go through a conversion course, right? We can, um, uh, but but, but I, I want to say, I, I want to go back to what you said about ethnic identity. It's also not so simple because to become Jewish is not just to affirm a belief. It's also to join a community. What does it mean for someone to say, I identify not only with the teachings of Judaism, the values of Judaism, uh, I was going to say the God of Judaism, but I don't know how different the God of Judaism, I mean the God of Judaism is the monotheistic God. I guess in principle we have the same basic idea and it's refractive in different ways, but all right, but there are differences. But, but, uh, what, but then what does it mean to say, I'm, I, 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 I feel as if I'm part of the chain of Jewish history. I stood at Sinai to receive the Torah. How do you say that? Now, of course, you need not have stood at Sinai, because I didn't stand at Sinai either, although I was there. I obviously didn't stand there. So it's not a matter of physical, historical event in someone's life. But it's a question of assimilating an identity and, and understanding uh, philosophically, conceptually, and psychologically that I've joined the people. And all that that means, one of the things I re used to require students to do is to read the Jewish journal. In order to become Jewish, you had to read a weekly journal that's not so great. Not because it was so elevated, on the contrary. I want someone to know what it means to live in a community. A community is full of bad stuff. There's competition and enmity. There's nationalism. There's Israel. There are, there are good Jewish stories. There are bad Jewish stories. You have to understand something. You're joining a community with all the flavors of the family and all that happens in the family. How do you begin, how do you begin to turn that on and sense, I'm part of this? I feel part of it. I want to raise a Jewish family, perhaps. By the way, not a bad reason to want to become Jewish. But, uh, maybe the most stable reason. I'm, 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 I have a, a, a friend, a mate. I'm going to get married, and I want to become part of the community. I, that I really get. I think that's a great... That, that, that says something to me. Uh, because I want our children, I want our family to share celebrations, and I want to create some stability in our lives. But I could go on and I should stop you. Oh, good. So I, can, can I just very add, helpful answer. add on please, to what yes, was said? Please do. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, people are always shocked when I don't go, great! You know? And, <laughs> Got another one. Right, right. And they say, but other people, you know, like I want to become a Muslim, I, I can, you know, affirm certain things. No, quite the opposite. And yet, I really, for many years, would not participate in anyone's conversion. I felt exactly as Rabbi Sadler Feller says, who am I to do that? 
But over time, as a rabbi in a very mixed community, I've discovered that it's very important to empower a family to have a sense of unity. And where I find myself getting involved now mostly with conversion are people who have lived a Jewish life for years. And they're the other spouse, right? And it's bar mitzvah time. And they've spent all these years driving this child to Hebrew school, sitting with me. I teach a class for mothers and during the Hebrew school time about Jewish traditions. And they, they've been a part of Jewish life. And it's almost like an affirmation of, I'm Jewish. Even then, you have to go take a class, right? It's not that I'll stamp you on the head. And I often send people to formal classes run in our rabbinic institutions here. There are two of them that I offer as a choice. I don't have enough people to run a class, and I become a sponsor. And I've done a number of conversions in the last five or six years uh, that have made for better families. These families were going to be Jewish anyway. Um, the question of the quickie conversion before marriage because grandma wants it, I won't go down that path. This is something very deep. But when you've lived a Jewish life and you're on your third kid's bar mitzvah already and you make Shabbos, you light candles every Friday night and you wouldn't dream of not having a Seder, why can't you call yourself Jewish? You've joined the Jewish people. And I do more and more conversions because I work in this kind of a community. Great, thank you. Uh, this, this next question is um, sort of the, the elephant in the room today because of the elections. It was not part of the, uh, the, what was said. But I just want to ask your, by the way, today was um, Israel's national election. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's party was uh, uh, basically uh, supposed to win. Um, by, a, by a long shot. However, there, there's a centrist party that's, that's coming along. But how is, how is the election that occurred today, uh, as I say, this was not planned, but because today is the election, I thought it appropriate, the students are reading the headlines. How is... Do you read the newspapers? <laughs> <laughs> Headline news. Uh, they get it on their tweets. Right. <laughs> is... Is Netanyahu's, or I'll put it this way, how is Netanyahu's uh, renewal of another four years, how is it going to affect uh, Judaism, global, global Judaism? How, what kind of impacts are going to be, what are the implications of him being elected to another four years? First, one has to ask the question, how is it going to affect Israel? <clears throat> And because it's not the same question. Right, right. And the relationship between Israel and America, or Israel and what we call the diaspora, is a very complex question. And, and the relationship of American Jews to even knowing what's going on in the election in Israel, if you all know what happened, you're better than half of my congregation. Because I don't know that they followed it closely enough. Having said that, and I'm sure the rabbi will give you all sorts of insights because he knows a lot about this. The election in Israel today actually sent a bit of a slap in the face to Netanyahu. He did not win with the margin that he was expected to win. Mm, right. And it was predicted that the centrist party would do very badly and that an ultra-right party, Israel Betenu, would do much better than it did. And so just seeing a headline that says Netanyahu wins election four more years is completely to miss the point. There is change afoot in Israel. And what we learn today is that more and more Israelis, when they go into a poll, are in actual to vote, are willing to go up against what is the current status quo. And that was not predicted, particularly. Now, where that will go, theirs is a coalition government. 
So it can put itself together, you have to have partners, and what's important is who's your partner in the government. Will Netanyahu still be able to move center right, or will he need to deal with a larger centrist party? That's, I particularly, I, my political bent is that I hope to see that centrist party grow. So Israeli politics are a very complicated dance. The subsequent question is what is the relationship of American Jews and American Jewry to Israel and its politics and its policies? And that's, that's, a, that's a question I'm willing to let Rabbi Seidenfelder say whatever he has to say and then if you wanted to go back there and lead up the rest of the evening. So I, I leave that to you. I think that um, there's a sizable portion of Jews, both in America and in Israel, uh, who are uh, moving inward and for whom uh, Israeli politics uh, have, has be have become um, so alienated um, that uh, it's actually led to some uh, interesting, uh, I, I think, certainly in Israel, uh, an exploration of spirituality and of cultural expression and creativity as an alternative uh, to the hope for political change. I think that uh, Netanyahu has succeeded in neutralizing uh, the hope that people had that there might be a resolution of a conflict in the Middle East. Uh, I think that even with this, uh, you know, small margin, uh, I, I, I see no uh, impetus and motivation on his part uh, to make any move. Um, it may mean that the moves, the more extreme moves, will be more difficult. Uh, there was a lot of talk about annexation. I don't know if you're following, but I mean, this is very, you know, we, 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 we generally think that, uh, you know, what Israel wants to do is good, and the American government should support what Israel wants to do. Uh, it's not clear that that, well, uh, from my perspective, it is clear that that's not true. Um, I, I think it's very bad that the American government stands by and allows Israel to continue its policies because in the long term, the, uh, you're dealing with a very uh, unstable part of the world and I, and I think that there needs to be some movement, a movement towards um, resolution to, keep, to, to provide the Palestinians with some hope. Um, I, I don't want to make any predictions, you know, because there are already some articles about the fact that there's another uprising uh, on the horizon on the Palestinian part. I do think that Netanyahu has a record. His record is stolen. He has a record. I mean, everybody can explore it. He hasn't made a move forward. Um, and even though he, in 2009, he actually spoke about a two-state solution, he's done nothing to move, uh, to move that agenda. So I think that there's every indication that he doesn't want to move that agenda, and that what he does want to do is at least stay put. 